Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Bimpure Live. I am your host, Nicolas Tellier. I am an architect, uh, a BIM specialist, and the founder of Bimpure and Revit Pure. Uh, today, we're going to talk about generative AI using tools such as Midjourney. But before moving on with the guest, a couple of things to mention and to talk about first. As always, thanks to everyone watching live in the chat. Uh, we've got Faust from Fort Bragg, California, Pedro from Porto in Portugal, we've got Steven from Brattleboro, Vermont. We've got uh, Luke from San Francisco, Austin from Pennsylvania. So thank you for everyone watching live uh, and thanks for tuning in week after week. And if it's your first time on the show, welcome and please subscribe. It helps us a lot. Let's move on to uh, thanks to sponsor. Uh, Enscape is sponsoring this season of Bim Pure Life. Enscape is a visualization tool that you can use with Revit, but also with SketchUp and Rhino and ArchiCAD. And for this sponsorship, I've decided to have a feature of the week, a feature of the day. Uh, let's move on to that. So uh, today's feature with Enscape, it is uh, the sample files. If you Google sample Enscape, you can see multiple sample files uh, that can give you a preview of what Enscape can do. You have a list of materials. You have a sample Revit project. You can download either the standalone EXE file or the Revit project itself. And this is the material sample. And this is pretty helpful if you want to have a look, an overview of all the materials that are available with Enscape library and see them in action, uh, not only in the image, but once they're placed, what they actually look like. Uh, I do use this. This is pretty helpful. If you want to have a quick preview, you can see all the material kinds, including carpets and bricks and uh, even perforated metals, as you can see here. And then a whole collection of grass, uh, dirt, floor, concrete, and variety of metals. And, and this is a school standalone file, a point .exe file that you can run without having an Enscape license. You can just download them, download this file of the website, and just have an overview of what you can do instead inside of Enscape and have and see the assets in action. So you can see this is some sort of high school, you can walk around, uh, enter the school, and this is a nice wooden building, but it's showcasing uh, the power of Enscape and what it can do. And this is the Revit project. Uh, this is kind of a, a brick corner building. And it's nice to see this Revit file in action before you open it in Enscape. And now we're inside of it and we can walk around the file. You can see multiple assets. You can see the green roof, uh, nice looking trees and street assets. Uh, let, let's walk around and see uh, what's up in this file. So I think there's actually some sort of cafe. If you press spacebar, you can go through the window. Uh, and here, yeah, it's a nice looking cafe with uh, the, the green wall and there's some kind of delicious looking <laughs> strawberry cake out there and in the cafe. So the, the point here is that there's a lot of simple files and you can have a look and see what can actually be done. And it can give you inspiration for the kind of assets you're using in, uh, in Revit for Enscape visualization. So thank you, Enscape, for sponsoring uh, this season of Bim Pure Live. And something else, we've just released pamphlet number 30. Since uh, 2016, we've been releasing four pamphlets a year. Pamphlets are free PDF guide about a specific Revit topic. And this is just fresh out of the oven, at least if you're watching live. And you can download this new pamphlet at revitpure.com slash excel. And this one is just how to take Excel data and bring it into Revit. And I give a few different examples. And one of them that I really enjoy is by using the Dynamo multiplayer plugin. What you can do with that is you can batch multiple models to go through one or multiple Dynamo script. And you can also schedule uh, using the Windows task uh, the setter, which means that, for example, you could have batch run multiple Dynamo scripts to run in the middle of the night. Uh, while you're sleeping, instead of having to do it manually one by one. 
a pretty amazing uh, free tool, Dynamo Multiplayer by Bird Tools. Anyway, all of that is mentioned in the in this pamphlet. It's all free and you can download it at revitpure.com slash Excel. Uh, all right. Uh, so today's guest is Tim Fu. Tim is currently based in London, UK. Uh, previously, Tim used to work as a designer at Zaha Hadid Architects. And now he's just started his own firm called Studio Tim Fu. So I'm welcoming to the show. Uh, Tim, how are you doing, Tim? Hey, Nicolas. I'm doing all right. Thanks for the invitation. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. So, well, first, congrats on starting uh, your, your own firm at Studio Tim Fu. So I guess, I know you have some slides about it, but I'll just ask in the discussion. How did you get interested in AI? Uh, well, I started uh, a while ago when, uh, actually not even a while ago. I mean, it's been a year, you know, so it's pretty recent in that sense. But I started when I started seeing a lot of AI um, images being outputted digitally online. And so I wanted to give it a go myself. Um, if you want, I can showcase the um, the images related to this topic. Yeah, sure. Uh, it'd be good to, to know. But uh, just finishing this point, I know I, I've tried by myself. It was, was it Dali or Dali Mini? And it, at first it was almost like jokes or memes that you could do with it. It was these ridiculous images and people were ty typing like the most absurd prompts you could and the result mm -hmm. was pretty funny and then we went from that it seems like a couple of months later it turned into amazing images uh, that i was seeing with mid journey so it's, it's pretty yeah. wild how fast everything went but uh, yeah, yeah let's switch so we can uh see your screen just give me a moment here yeah there you go we can see your screen now yeah. Okay. Great. So, I mean, you know, really started with just, um, looking at what's available, uh, on, for example, Instagram, we started seeing a lot of these, um, uh, images tagged designed by Zaha Hadid. And at the time working in Zaha Hadid, I was quite curious to see AI's interpretation of those things. So like, these are example of like images that you would find, um, at the very early stages. So from there, I wanted to see how, I, at least through someone working inside, would interpret um, the results. So I started on my side to experiment with uh, the AI. And early on, I produced, you know, really whimsical, more so chaotic results, which I thought was very fun and artistically sort of satisfying, if you will. But uh, after a while, the goal really changed for me. And that's when I started to take things onto another um, level. This is when I started to find ways to control the geometries and produce results that can actually help, um, you know, um, contribute to the conversation of what AI can do in buildable construction. So from this series of um, results, I started to gradually um, understand how to work the AI towards feasible results, control it, and then produce things that you can, you know, eventually bring into the um, concept design phase of any project. So those were like the experiments I started early on. And, you know, from on Instagram, this is where I showcased a lot of these results. And from there, eventually, I got to start teaching at Parametric Architecture Academy. And so it was a more of a systematic approach later on where I, you know, had observations. I started to um, understand all the workflows of the type of work that's required to get to what you where you wanted. So you can just say that all in all, it's like a very simple process to type in a bunch of words. But once you have the words, um, how you then proceed to enhance your resulting design and resulting aesthetics of your image, that became sort of like a fine tuning art form in its own sense. So that's the type of work that I try to produce and teach as well. And uh, yeah, a lot of nuances involved going from last year to now, since the technology has improved so much. Uh, um, I'm curious. I'm curious. What is what was your role uh, role at Zaha before um, you started exploring AI? You were a designer, so what yeah, tools were so, you using on a daily basis? I'm just wondering how natural it was f for you to move from what you were using to mm. uh, going through these AI tools. Yeah, so contrary to popular belief, I'm not the AI guy of the office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so actually, I would showcase here 
I worked mostly on um, the Unicorn Island project in China, and this is a huge master plan with a lot of um, towers and um, urban landscapes. And so I was the kind of like the parametric facade specialist doing the facade rationalization of all these complex geometries. And did that you requires... use did you use Rhino and Grasshopper a lot? Where these yes, tools yes, that's yeah, principally okay. my tool. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. So I mean, there's folks that focus on using um, Maya. There is the BIM team focusing on using Revit, and then there's us who is kind of like linking the two, where you have a lot of people who is creating concepts, and us who is like rationalizing it, making sure it's uh, buildable. There's repeating modules and it's more oriented on budget. And uh, finally, you then bring it to the BIM team and the other folks. So it's like a different compartments of specialists and each working on their own uh, sort of fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's pretty much where um, I stopped doing mostly that type of work on my own time i started to look into ai and so last year it was like you know uh, a great time for me to showcase a lot of work get a lot of traction online but eventually the technology improved so much astoundingly and for me i was you know flabbergasted at the sort of um, trajectory of our technology like this is where we are more recently you can see the the sort of the visual quality and the design as well as you can see the, for example, things that make sense, like the, the form work patterns, how it works with the geometry, like everything seems to be so fine tuned these days. And of course, there's still a lot of things to improve, but uh, where we're heading to is, uh, is quite uncertain just because it's uh, quite revolutionary. You can see the improvement that it's uh, taking. Yeah, I'm curious, how did you end up using mostly um, mid journey? And how does it compare to other uh, AI rendering tool out there? Like what are the other options? Mm -hmm. Stable Diffusion and there is uh, DALI as well. So, yes, yes. Yeah, so, why, do you, why are you using mostly mid-journey? So this is like, you know, where you judge what each are good at. Mostly I use mid-journey because it's just visually superior. These designs are more resolved and it's creating geometries that are uh realizable because a lot of other ais kind of make sense on a local level but then when you look at it is this like a concave or convex like things don't make sense except from afar so i don't know how they did it but the majority team really created its own sort of you know proprietary machine algorithm that surpasses all the competitors right now and I've also just tested DALI 3 recently and, you know, it's improved a lot since it's old DALI version, but it's also not superior to Midjourney as of yet. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That, that was going to be a, another question. I've played a, a little bit with it and that much DALI 3, just for context, there's OpenAI mm -hmm. who are doing ChatGPT, which we talked about in last week's episode. Mm -hmm. um, but they also have this image rendering model, DALL-E, and they've just released DALL-E 3. I think the big difference is the prompting. With Midjourney, you have this uh, very specific way of prompting, which is the text that you need to type to get the image. And with DALL-E, it, it can be more natural language. You just describe in a few sentences what you need instead of having to learn these uh, quirks and use a, a lot of commas. So. Uh, what do you think about this? Do you think that you prefer the way of prompting of Midjourney, or do you think more natural language is, uh, is going to be the way in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question because on one hand, the English language is kind of like, kind of, you know, optimized for our everyday conversations, but not as well controllable as for example, mid journeys, lack of large language model. Mm -hmm. And what I teach is, for example, you know, your set of words. I don't, I tell students not to be grammatically correct because you're wasting like word real estate, if you will. A set of words, I say, imagine every local cluster of these words, the type of results it produces. For example, beautiful, Banff, Lake, HT, photography. You're from uh, Canada, so you can 
imagine already visually how beautiful that type of place would be. And then I tell them to imagine every local cluster, like floating house and low poly triangle. If these words were to interact locally, for example, if you search it on Google, what it would look like. And so you have to have this sort of practice where you are not just typing out what you want, like you're talking to a person, but you are imagining the querying results that you get as you would with Googling an image. So, because it works as query, you know? So then you're able to understand what type of search results is going to be predominant for the algorithm to learn. And from there, you have to imagine all those local cluster of words, if it cohesives together, what type of image it would result. And then it comes to a point where when the words slightly change, when you change, when you add a word or subtract a word, that's when you start to fine tune and prompt craft because you can control it. It's fine tuning and you can control the direction. You can nudge it to a certain space. So instead of like how I feel, how I work with Dali, where you describe what you want and just hope for the best here with the uh, mid journey is a process of fine tuning and controlling, which is something that I cannot find with Dali three, because you're still being forced to create something completely new every single time you prompt something. Whereas here, with Midjourney, it's really for the advanced users. And beyond that, what Midjourney can also do is correct local areas. Like you can select the certain areas that needs to be refined. For example, you can see like there's like a lack of um, finesse with the stair as well as the corner. And then you can just ask it to fix those certain areas. And so that's a degree of control that Dali does not have and only Midjourney has. So yeah, that's I'm why. curious how what what do you type like do you clean a corner like that? Oh, it's Is like it... you know how you have Photoshop like smart fill generative yes. fill. Yes, yeah, okay. Like so that. you're using that to complement. Uh, no, no. I'm saying no, you can. Okay. It's like equivalent of that in Midjourney itself. Okay, yeah. Like you're literally able. Here, you know what? If I showcase, um, if I showcase my PDF, this is probably a little more, a um, little more straightforward. So you see, for example, down here, like these are just me selecting the area on the top of the tower of this plaza that I want to change. And you can see it's able to just immediately reproduce so many different iterations that they all seem to fit the context and seem to fit the surrounding uh, architecture. So you see, that's the power of, of this particular aspects. Um, you're able to just generate, you know, additive results and correct places that you it needs to be corrected. And when you select the area to correct it, you can also type in the prompt to describe how you want it to be corrected. So that degree of control is, is something that you don't see in any other software. And mm -hmm. on top of that, you can see, for example, the top, this is like the um, form finding process that I go through with um, using AI. It's like meticulous and people see the final image I produce, but they don't know the type of um, process you go through. But really it's, you can see a lot of work has been done to push in different directions, nudging, pushing. Um, typically you see much more crazier images and results with the form is incredibly unrefined. And so when you just fine tune it to a certain extent, you end up then with a result that you would deem as, um, refined uh, and modular and constructible. So as long as you have that as an architect in your head to know what to look for, then, then you can um, push the AI towards um, the direction you already have in your head. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a fine amount of control you can have with Midjourney. Yeah, so uh, earlier you, you showed that the corner that was fixed. I'm curious, in Midjourney, can you like pinpoint part of the image and say we work this specific part? Or yep. it is true, like very precise prompt that you're able to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't even need to listen to your prompt exactly. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, again, with this one, all I did was take the first image and I selected this region that I wanted to correct, right? Just this region. And once I selected that region, it produced all the other results for me. And sometimes I don't even have to change the prompt. I just roll the dice multiple times until I get what I want. And with corners, it's the same thing. You can find uh, rolling the dice a few times, you'll eventually find one that is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, is this a new feature? I've played with Midjourney 
maybe last time a couple of months ago and i don't remember seeing this feature not but i'm not new. totally it's up to date few months already yeah, yeah okay. it's all very region <laughs> once you upscale you'll find it uh we we have a comment from uh, uh andreas in the chat saying but the image are not associated with any architectural floor plan so so no just for well i don't think so <laughs> but for the context these are <laughs> Uh, image generation for the first part of a project. Yeah, so right? I face this type of um, concerns a lot. So mm -hmm. they, I think people have to kind of shift the way they think about um, what this tool is providing. Because when the traditional paradigm of looking at a well-produced image is a human expectation that everything is resolved. But what it actually is, is more like a concept sketch, except this concept sketch is taking in form of such a detail. So when you're looking at a napkin sketch by Frank Gehry, you're not expecting a floor plan, a detailed BIM model, or resolved solutions on a local level. You're given a overall concept, right? That's the thing that I want people to understand is like, a lot of these sort of conceptual architectural generations that you can do with AI is here to aid your concept design process. There will eventually be an AI potentially that can take in BIM models and produce all of those results that you seek. But uh, that's a different type of AI and we have to talk about them at different aspects of it. Because um, what is powerful right now about these conceptual AI is that it jogs your creative um process is here to aid in the concept phase so i think people have to really shift away from the traditional point of understanding of what um uh the computational design process is because it's it's every phase that the ai can help you with it's not just detailing things or refining things we're giving technical solutions it's also giving quali qualitative solutions so in many aspects, for example, you know, I would crumble a piece of paper and then let it just produce um, architectural expressions from different other architects. But this is merely the same way Frank Gehry would crumble a piece of paper to generate some sort of idea. It's not supposed to be refined. You're not supposed to sort of look at a sketch and ask for, did you resolve this or that? Because different phases have different processes. And uh, we have to talk about the different processes that exist in architecture. So AI, absolutely helpful in the concept phase, but we're not there yet in the BIM phase and in the detailing phase, but it's getting there. Yeah, where, where at least they're not connected yet. I've, <clears throat> I saw, I had an episode a few weeks ago with Martin Day that uh, I think you spoke at one of his conference, right? In, in XDev in london am i right am yeah I, I was there but i i have to see the face <laughs> there's a lot of people i met just uh... yeah, yeah but but martin talked about um multiple ai solutions for bim one of them can take a rivet model and generate a set of drawings but that's kind of separate and mm -hmm. last week we had chat gpt to help create formulas and custom toolbar in rivet also kind of mm -hmm. separate so we have these solutions but they're each involved in different phases of the project and what we're seeing here here is more in the early phase before BIM is even involved, I would say. Yes. Yes, That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing in the chat a couple of questions. Uh, people, uh, Eman is asking, have you tried Verus? How does it compare with Midjourney? Are you familiar with uh, Verus from uh, Evolve yes. Labs? Uh, it's the one that um, is taking your drawings and then producing realistic renders it, yeah it's taking it's yeah it's starting from a 3d view instead of starting from uh from scratch or just a prompt mm -hmm. okay and so it yeah go i ahead. don't use it i've i've seen it i know what it's capable of but the fact i don't use it is actually because i have uh been using another program called um called look x so for example i can show you what look x does is very much the same thing you are producing either 3D model, physical model, whatever, in the sense of is a visual input. And then when you prompt uh, something, it automatically converts it into something detailed. And that also works with either sketch plans or CAD plans. You could generate floor plans out of it, for example. And some of you have seen this one. 
you can take things from nature and even allow it to become something realistic. So that's why I've been using Look X because it's um it's a relatively new um way of thinking, but uh, the office the the company has been for a while in the AI domain, and uh, they're really good at taking massing models and then producing relatively good um, render quality images. And right now I'm working on a real life project that is um, pretty large scale project with multiple parcels and we have massing models. So I can put that right away into look X to generate realistic output and I change the materials. We show the clients, you know, they're also happy to see a lot of these selections very quickly to at least be able to uh, get an idea, a very rough idea of the of the massing studies that you do. So I think Look X does very much what um, Veras does. And the difference is uh, Look X is also like specifically trained on architectural data. Its the entire database is architecture. So um, I think it has that advantage over others. Yeah, I'm looking. Is it lookx.ai? Yeah, lookx.ai. Okay, I'll just paste it in the chat. I I haven't heard of it before, so it's interesting to learn about this. There you go. So it's in the chat. I've put the link for people interested in this tool. Yeah, so I wish I had more stuff to show for lookx. Well, there's this one. So uh, this is me using... Uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm to create multiple iterations where the AI, well, the genetic algorithm is optimizing the um, massing for optimal behavior. So while that is happening, I um, got these images and then I inserted that into LookX to produce a more realistic output. So here we can see kind of like two AIs working simultaneously where um, the genetic algorithm is optimizing the massing while look X is giving you a idea of what it looks like in real life, each of those massings. And this is happens in, in seconds, you know? And then here, for example, is me confirming the optimal massing and then just changing materiality. So you can see how look X is able to keep your massing, your all your dimensions as it was, and this is in London, and it's just producing various um, resulting material choices and architectural expressions. So you can get a lot of you know quick ideas out of um, this process. And okay, what what was the first tool that you used for this one when we saw the the thing moving? That was a different kind of AI, or it's just yeah. parametric? Yeah, with, this is uh... a a type of AI called genetic algorithm. And for this particular okay. one, I used Octopus, uh, which is uh, a plugin for third-party plugin for grasshopper in rhino okay so, so that's that's a rhino model we're seeing this is a rhino model okay yeah. I see. and then the uh, image background okay and, and ladybug as well for um yeah, yeah. Uh, evaluation yeah uh all right meanwhile i can this is fascinating by the way <laughs> uh, lots of tools i've never heard about um, there, there's a question from Nunia it says, any concerns about copyright infringement when using prompts, such as I, you know, do it in Zahadid style or Frank Gehry style. What do you think about that ownership of different artists? I saw the same concerns, like if in mid journey, like do a drawing in the style of, you know, an artist that is currently living, for example, what do you yeah. think about it? Oh God, this topic, <laughs> you know, because. I feel like I'm in the minority, but I have a very strong opinion. Uh -huh, yeah. And I'm extremely against the way people are perceiving what AI is, what it does, and what should be copyrightable. First of all, it's like standard US international law that co like style is not copyrightable. This exists in art, in architecture, in anything. If you like take a style of something and you do something completely new, but imitating someone else's style doesn't matter. You know, the idea that style can be copyrightable is kind of ridiculous. And if we live in a world where that will actually be uh, persecuted, then you are never going to have any continuation of culture because every, you know, 
element of culture is a continuation of the past. Everything we do as creators and designers is inspired by the things that we're taught, the things that we've learned, the predecessors, the people that came before us. As I say, there's no postmodernism without modernism. One thing came after another. So you get into this gray area of, of what the hell you can even uh, take ownership of. Because, yeah, you can take ownership of the object, but if you take ownership of the style, that's a, you know, a can of a worm that you don't want to open. So, the, yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. It's like, what, what is a style, you know? It's pretty hard to define. Can you patent a style? Probably not. Yes, you can exactly. patent specific projects. No, I mean, yeah. there's so many architects that base their style off of other architects, you know? Yeah. I, I don't want to point any fingers, but just for an example, uh, MAD Architects who, um, you know, kind of got a lot of sort of work carried on from Zaha Hadid style. Mm -hmm. And then Zaha Hadid, she herself was heavily influenced at her early phases by uh, uh, Malevik style. Mm -hmm. Malevik, the suprematist uh, movement, you know, the Russian suprematist movement. And everything carried on to one another. So it's hard to say, um, you know, how much influence one influence the other, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, are you still there, Tim? Uh, it, it seems that uh, Tim is frozen at the moment. I guess he'll be reconnecting. All right. Meanwhile, can I still see a screen? All right. We'll leave a couple of minutes for, for Tim. Uh, to come back, it seems like he's frozen. I, I hope everything is fine for for guys in, in the chat. Meanwhile, so okay. All right, a, a small glitch, folks. It's happening. So Tim should be coming back. And this again, there he is. Wow, lost my internet. I think uh, had a problem there. Yeah, no problem. Can can you uh, share your screen again? Yeah, or back. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it was the uh, the artist alliance for copyright that attacked you, <laughs> hacked your computer. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, this type of argument I think has more um, grounds in the art world, mm -hmm. and even less grounds in the design world because yeah. The things that we design are supposed to work in real life. You know, whatever style we adapt into a new massing, a new building, the bulk of the work is not the the concept images, not the AI. It's how you, you know, actually implement it, how you fix, how you measure all the doors and the windows and the handrails and how they work at a, such a minuscule scale, how you panelize the flooring tiles and all these things, which is really the bulk of the work and requires a whole team of people to do. Any concept is just a concept. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't think, um, I don't Not think we worried about yeah. it. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And looking at the chat, most people seem to, uh, to, to agree with you on that. Yeah, it's true that if the culture is going to move around, we're going to have to move past the, these kind of limitations, I think. <clears throat> I think people are really stuck in the past with, mm -hmm. with regards to this uh, conversation because, you know, um, we had many tools in the past that uh, work just by us using it and then doing our own thing out of it. But the AI is kind of like, because you're able to prompt and query another artist, our traditional mentality is to think that, okay, that sounds like it's copying because it's, it's taking data from um, other people. But uh, I think that's a very 20th century way of thinking on a 21st century technology because we have to reframe the way we think about what what is a tool, what is uh, plagiarizing and what is um, AI. And if you actually look at nuances, what AI does is it, it pattern recognizes, which means it does what humans do. If you ask the AI to scrape the data of whatever architect or artist, what it does is it takes the data and it learns from it. And then it produces something new out of it just by its correlations of pixels. I mean, that's literally what artists do. If, an, if I tell an art student to go into a Van Gogh museum 
and learn all the paintings of Van Gogh and try to replicate Van Gogh's style, but paint something completely different. Would Van Gogh, who is dead, would Van Gogh should have copyright to the student's work who um, learned from his style, right? The obvious answer is no for that student. But the moment you replace the student with a machine that can do what the students is doing, but at a much more efficient rate, then people start to have a sort of a lapse in sort of the way they think about this. Because machine does it so much better, they feel like it's a different method, but it's not. It's learning. Machine learning is learning. And I think that's the point I want to try to make because sadly, I think majority of the people in this argument is trying to um, think about it in a traditional sense and be on the other side of the argument. And I've seen so many laws right now that are being um, kind of implemented. I see the restrictions that DALI 3 has with regards to who you can prompt. You know, Mid Journey, I've been prompting, for example, Zaha D style. I don't care. I, I prompt the hell out of it. But then here in DALI 3, you're not allowed to do that. You know, you, you prompt in Zaha Hadid, it's going to say, this is an existing architect. You cannot prompt other people's style, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, in, Ad, in Adobe out. too, I think, right? Sorry? In Adobe, too, in Adobe tools. Yes, I think Adobe, the same thing. Yeah. Adobe too, especially. You know, someone at the AI Summit who worked for Adobe was, was having a conversation with me about this, where they think it was supposed to empower the artist. And mm -hmm. I told them it's completely contrary to that because yeah. uh, what you're doing is creating this sort of over commodified system in a world where free information becomes more more free flowing and i think we have to prepare for a society and a world that information proprietorship is no longer the essence of how we drive our economy it should be the idea the ideator the owner the architect the creator the person who type in the concept the person who thought about what should be brought into existence regardless whoever style they would like to um, prompt into. So I think the world is not ready to think in this way. And majority of people don't think in this way. So I will have to continue, you know, and my tirade in this particular. Yeah, yeah. well, I like it. I, I like that you have a strong stance on it and advocating. Uh, honestly, most of the arguments I saw were pro pretty much on the, the side of protecting the artist, but the, the way you frame it, it's true that, you know, it's it's a style. It's not a specific piece of art. It's, so it's yeah. totally different. And I yeah. could see the, the limitation and it's not necessarily even helping the artist mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Um, so how do you think the role of the architect is going to change with, with, with AI, especially but overall, but in these early phases? Do you think it's just another tool in the toolbox? Or it's, it's, you think that AI is, is such a powerful technology that it, it could change way beyond just another tool in the toolbox? Um, I mean, that uh, depends on how far in the future you want me to project, right? <laughs> yeah. This is something that is going to continuously improve. And um, I realize we can only underestimate AI. We cannot overestimate it. And that's kind of a, a fear that I even myself have as much as people think I'm an advocate for it, I am an advocate for the advancements of our, you know, industry from being able to take advantage of these tools. But at the same time, we have to face the fact that the job sectors are going to shift. We're going to have to adapt to it. So for example, like out of what I think so far, what we have, AI concept exploration is a big topic. And this one is already, you know, something that AI is, really seeping into for example showcasing you guys what i can do with these very very primitive versions of ai already and then for example here i take ai designed images and then i let another video ai called inch uh called runway ml this ai takes an image and makes a video out of it and so then all of a sudden you get like a experience you get like a a preview a sneak peek into a conceptual idea that you can take as a sort of way to progress in your design. So it's kind of like um, it's kind of like how you use pin interest at the very beginning of some sort of design phase to get some ideas. In this way, you are prompting your own Pinterest. You're creating your own world that you want 
in terms of aesthetics, of spatial quality, of materiality, of color. All these things are completely under your control. And it's just how you want to express the spaces in three dimensions. And the AI is able to produce that in milliseconds. And so you're bombarded with thousands of concepts and idea. So that is going to hugely change the way we, we explore concepts, first of all. And then after that, another part I would say is the AI rendering. The, the rendering industry is going to be definitely one of the uh, people in the front line of the AI replacement. I think renderers jobs are incredibly important, how you finesse an image. But I think the future is when people take the um, is when renderers actually take your um, let me let me go back to the slide again is when renderers will take use of this te technology because when you prompt something so basic as a massing model and you can generate something in detail um, that's great that's highly efficient but then how you produce images that are well uh, composited well composed well um, materialed I think those decisions will require the the human requirement of what it takes to be a good renderer so those guys will need to sort of really adapt this into the design process, into their production process. Because I think rendering companies are definitely going to see a huge shift first before everyone else in the industry. For us working with BIM, working with construction, they are going to see potential large language models take over in the later stages. But, you know, there's so much nuances of, of these little decision-making that is less explicit for the AI to be able to readily produce a result that I think is going to take a little bit longer for the large language model AIs to really catch up to replace these aspects of human task. But it's getting there, you know? So we're seeing, for example, concept AI, mid-journey, rendering AI, look X or Veras, as we send, and then BIM, conversion and generative detailing, construction documentation, these are large language model potentials. So we're seeing AI sort of kind of like manifest itself in all uh, chain of this process and each at different rates. So potentially we're waiting for them to connect. But when it does, we'll have a streamline of AI concept of AI construction, potentially even literally construction like robotic automation, everything completely. AI operated. We have to believe in that world because we're heading there. You know, automated self-driving cars, this is already very close. And once we don't drive anymore, we're going to be sitting in our driverless cars, figuring out how do we control the automated AI for construction. And those mm -hmm. things are literally in the horizon as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about the human input when that time comes. Is about how we should incorporate what is important that humans have that, that the AI doesn't. That's a question we should ask. Like what we as humans are that are different from machines. So it becomes sort of like an existential question of really what we are outside of technology and what we can do that technology cannot replace. Yeah, these are some pretty good questions. Um... So we, we could see a future where we generate an image and then from that image, you can generate a model and from the model, you generate drawings and then or maybe you don't even need drawings. Maybe it goes from the model straight to the shop or straight to the field and it's AI driven construction, some, something like that. This is more in the future, but I can, I see no reason why that wouldn't be possible. Yeah, the, the beauty of uh, what you're saying is interesting because the beauty of it is you could do both, right? Because the, we mm -hmm. value human art. So mm -hmm. potentially we value sketching something, letting AI give you the details because then you have the human touch. Or you can just say, we don't sketch anything. We implicitly allow AI to generate the massing based on our sustainable requirements, our occupancy requirements. And so generative AI, generative design, this is another domain that can definitely allow AI to self-manifest, almost like nature. We're almost creating a sort of like a uh, nature generative sort of uh, world where we just program the genes in a way. 
but the genes happen to be scripts and algorithms. But uh, the results is the optimized society. Yeah, that was another of my question. I saw an article of yours, I think on uh, Dizim, and you were talking about, well, there's this nature mimicry that AI seems to be able, you, you saw that, um, mm -hmm. the, 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 what was it the pine cone uh, image where yes. that an object from nature that is turned into a building. But even on, on the article I saw from you, you talked about how we're, we're bu building a lot of boring boxes and that AI could allow a return to ornamentation and maximalism. And I saw a few questions of people in the chat saying, well, these are really free forms, uh, sure. kind of buildings that you're showcasing. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Do you think AI will change the architecture style that we could build and make it easier to build that way? It could, it could. Uh, I think we have to talk about form. We have to talk mm -hmm. about yep. the existence of rectilinearity, why we had this form in the first place, right? Like, I think the industrial revolution and modernism took our form design and made everything rectilinear for the sake of compartmentalization, ease of prefabrication, repetition, modularization, we built our society on these forms. A table is a square rectangle. Our building grid is a square rectangle. Our city is built on an iron grid. And this is for the sake of, you know, that sort of efficiency that we look for. But then nature is much more efficient than humans. When a human wants, for example, to design a city in an iron grid like Manhattan, nature wants to design a city like mycelium, allowing creation of like these complex networks that can be done much more efficient than humans can. For example, I think they use mycelium to map out like, you know, the most uh, efficient connectivity of a Tokyo uh, metro transit. And it turns out to be more efficient than what humans can do because, you know, these uh, sort of emergent intelligence from these uh, intelligence AIs at, or, um, you know, natural sort of emergent uh, intelligence, for lack of a better word, is that they, they can find solutions that humans can't with our rigid systems that we have in place right now. And so I think the idea that the rectilinear idea of our city and architecture and visual and ar architectural expression is just a modernist industrial post-industrial vestige that we should reanalyze again, because we are now living in a world where things can be generative. And I'm not talking just about form imitation. I'm talking about the fact that the forms that you find in nature are efficient because, you know, so it's not um, as easy to construct from our traditional perspective. But if our future is riddled with 3D printing or drones layering the bricks for you or um, non-traditional architectural forms, then we will be able to welcome a future where uh, high performing geometry will be the priority. And as you see in nature, why nature have so many of these complex forms instead of everything rectilinear is because high performing geometry requires uh, these organic forms. Like it's going to take in the form that's going to be best performing. So. I think because that na natural forms is superior in many ways due to its performance, we're always going to try to optimize our form based on those performances, which is why Zaha Deed Architects, we've done a lot of, um, you know, these type of complex geometries, not only because it looks cool, but um, you've done a lot of sort of calculations, either, you know, CFD or uh, solar, and you realize that parametricism as a philosophy is not about um, visual. It's about performance. And in a world where we can produce non-repetitive structural members as efficiently, there's no need to repeat. And we can allow performance to be the main driver of form design. And that's why nature exists in such a beautiful and astounding way when it comes to form expressions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the work of uh, Neri Oxman? I've, yeah, I've been listening. Yeah, I've been listening to an interview of, of her Reactive recently with on, 
on on Lex Friedman. Just Lex Friedman, so, yeah. I was surprised that she 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 was a very unique uh person to be invited in that uh in that show. But I'm very glad someone in the design realm, especially yeah. computational design, is uh, representing. Yeah, like for those interested, type Neri Oxman on, on Lex Friedman, and she talks about nature versus human created, and how she she's trying or hoping that in the future we can build more in, inspired and connected to nature even mm -hmm. and one of the stats that was a bit shocking is that the total mass of human creation so roads buildings sidewalks is now superior to the mass of nature in, on planet earth on the surface which is pretty crazy when you think about it really for, for, from biosphere hmm. and but yeah there is she was previously at uh, mit lab and she's now exploring how we can do architecture more inspired by by nature but a, a big step to get there is to change how the construction process not just the design process so how will we get there everything is going to be uh 3d printed what is the process to get there i mean you know when we design we think about the construction process so mm -hmm. i think a lot of the ways when you get to detail designing and when you're understanding how the form is made and how every single uh you know, either it's timber, how many layers, how it interlaces. It's more so about how you understand what the construction is. So, for example, I'm doing like this parametric form. It's really based on understanding of, um, you know, what a dome, how it works, how interlacing uh, timber structure works. And it's really interesting because that's the driver of um, a lot of these designs. And... Um, yeah, we as architects, designers should always uh, design with an understanding of how it's being built, because you won't design something in a certain form unless you know it's optimized for the construction process. And so our future of our construction process is going to change because we have, again, 3D printing. Um, we have, uh, I mean, there's like curve folding, there's robotic arms, fabrication. And there's also, if I want to be daft uh potential back to manual construction manual carving so for this project i wanted to invert our expectations so you know you have like these beautiful renaissance uh, interiors and things but if you break it down into architectural elements uh we produce this idea of actually allowing ai to design this futuristic um decorative column but then i model this thing in 3d and i work with the, a german stonemason and uh, he hand carved this. And once he hand carved it, you can compare it to the original. It's kind of like reversing the relationship between the human and the machine, you know? Because uh, traditionally we thought while human is the designer, the machine is the fabricator. And so I think now with AI, we can actually invert that relationship for the first time, allowing AI to be the sort of the, the generator of ideas and allowing potentially human handicraft to reinvigorate our built world because it's such a millennia old um, practice of high arts that we have lost throughout the ages because we always revere, everybody reveres how beautiful a cathedral or all these um, traditional architecture is in any European city. And yet we build everything in mass fabricated concretes and boxes you know like what happened to the beauty of uh unless you you're looking at gaudi uh sagrada familia which is still under construction you rarely find this type of architecture exist in the current realm even though we revere it so much so i say for this project at least i wanted to kind of posit this question to say how we can bring human labor back into the design process but reverse relationship because by the time we are so you know overtaken by um by ai and we've been it's replaced all our, our manual task we decide what we want to do and perhaps what we want to do is hand carving for one of many examples and so is it a human artistic expression being expressed as part of the construction process as opposed to letting machines take over everything I think by then it's a choice of what humans want to do instead of uh, what humans should do when uh, when the machines take over. 
Mm-hmm. And something that has been surprising for me, you know, in the past, I thought that AI and automation would affect the more manual labor first. Mm-hmm. And it seems that in the last few years, actually, it's more the intellectual tasks or the, the kind of task that you do on a computer that has been uh, automated. And while like being a plumber actually seems like one of the safest job at the moment, mm-hmm. that yeah. it's going to be hardest. So it's it's funny that there's my expectations have been uh, hasn't been met in, in this regard. And well, that has been everyone's expectation, right? Since the mm-hmm. industrial revolution, we've got grown accustomed to the idea that machines are there to do the auto made a task, the boring yeah. task and the fabrication while humans do all the thinking. And then the AI took on a life of its own. We're literally in the middle of a revolution, I say in that sense, because contrary to the industrial revolution, now we're allowing machines to take over the thinking process and the intellectual task. And that's why I think with AI, it's not merely another technology. It is heralding a new revolution in the way humans is going to be uh, operating in the future. And that's why, yeah, as an architect, um, we get into this career thinking that it's the least replaceable job, right? Or anyone (laughs) in the creative field. Yeah, yeah. And first people are crying right now are the visual artists because... Mm -hmm the ones that are taking commission to do a uh, yeah. design that can now be done in mid journey in three seconds. They're the ones that are um, the first to be uh, concerned about this uh, revolution. And then comes the certain many of us that will be doing less creative tasks because the AI will be taking over those and also decision-making tasks, logical tasks, large language models can seem to be, performing very well in many of these uh, parameters. So yeah, it's a very strange place and time that we're in. And uh, it's only going to get more revolutionary. Yeah, for sure. All right, so we're we're close to the end. So let's, let's, let's talk about uh, doom and gloom a bit. (laughs) So what do you think about AI safety? Um, Do you think there's a risk for humans? I've seen multiple versions of it. For example, uh, Yuval uh, Harari, author of Yuval Sapiens, Harari, says, Harari. Yeah, says that it's the, the first, one of the first technology that takes power away from human. And I've seen CEOs of AI companies saying that, well, there's a chance between like 5 to 15% chance that humans will self-destruct because of AI. Are we worried about this or you think this is overblown? Yeah, you know, this this topic, I have many people have already talked over this and for me i try not to think about it too much yeah. because like my contribution to this conversation is the benefit of ai and you know speaking of harari i was um uh, speaking in the same conference as him and many uh, other uh, leading figures at the the cog x festival at the o2 in london and uh it's just staggering the amount of uh, speakers that are all voicing fear which is justified i'm not going to deny it but with that being said i feel our current dialogue conversation and lacks optimism towards ai on one hand i'm debating people regarding copyright issues on the other hand there's people that are um i wouldn't say fear mongering but definitely causing more concerns than the than than showcasing the benefits and my job here for me, at least I believe what I can do better is to showcase the objective positive benefits that can come out of AI if you introduce it into our built world, what it can build a better society under the control of the right people. So I am hesitant to talk about my fears because it's very real. Because let's face it, I I, I think about it all the time and I know that there's a very good chance that it's going to cause some big troubles in the future. But um, that being said, I think Elon Musk and those guys will tell you in more detail what they are. And I will, I also believe it to a certain extent, but on my end, I just want to make sure that people can see the positives because there's uh, going to be a lot of fear and it's going to continue. And there's a few of us that are trying to push the technology 
to its most optimal performance. And we're going to continue doing that because uh, we need a more nuanced discussion and uh, requires us to see what AI is capable of in contributing to our humanity. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Because in the end, it's not it's not your power to say what is going to happen. Your power is to sharing good words about uh, what good it can do to architecture and improve our buildings and our built environment. So that's yeah. definitely a good approach. You know, it's not on your hand what what happens in terms of uh, of safety or at least uh, on that scale. Mm -hmm. um, all right, maybe just a couple of uh, questions. There was a question from Elizabeth saying, talking about uh, quantity versus uh, quality of the work. Do you, do you think there's, again, not to talk too much about risks, but the, how do you see AI creating amazing buildings versus maybe just used to quick, quickly create a bunch of more standard buildings, automate uh, uh -huh. tasks so it can be done faster? Yeah, I mean, with any technology, it's a re responsibility of the user of the technology, whether or not you are uh, finessing your results to high quality and standards, or you're just doing whatever is most efficient. I think it's more of a political question than a design question. Um, when it comes to design, yes, I could take these ideas and design and make it as good as possible. Sometimes I spend hours, sometimes I spend days working on designs on AI to make sure that it produces the aesthetics quality that I'm looking for. And so with that level of care I have towards the aesthetics, I will also have towards the detailing. I will also have towards the functionality. And each of those segments of architecture, as long as you're there to be responsible enough to understand its importance and, and take care of it, then you're going to be on the right side of things. Um, that being said, yeah, it's a tool for efficiency. And like any tools, there will be people that will use it for pure feasibility. And you will create, lack of better word, shitty things with it, right? Like, for example, when Grasshopper came out, um, many people uh, spoke against parametric design and things like that. And there was a lot of uh, resistance towards it because why? There's all these people that do minimal effort parametric design. Uh, have you heard of like Voronoi, for example? One of many examples, like a uh, script that you just plug in and automatically generate these very quick that populated holes on things. And those are a bit overused because it's a very quick and easy way to generate something that looks sexy and cool, but in reality, it's just like a one script uh, thing. So like any tool, there will be people that take the shortcuts to do what they think is cool, but then there will be architects and real designers that have values that they are trying to incorporate in their design. And that takes time with any tools. So we live in the age of abundance now with AI, it's going to produce us more results than we're capable of digesting. So the responsibility, the onus is on the user, on the designer to produce a good result. So like any tool, don't blame the tool, blame the user. So yeah, that's all I have to say for that. I like it. So we're getting toward uh, the close of the show. So how can people get started? I know you have a course or else maybe someone who haven't really used Midjourney or AI tools that much. What is the first step to get started? I mean, first step, I think is just to uh, get a Try subscription and type mm -hmm. it in, type in your prompts and see where it goes. Because we have to realize that we're at the infancy of a technology and everybody is a, just a lonely fish swimming in the new deep blue ocean. Nobody has explored and nobody understands where it's going. I am like anybody else. We're just here to figure out its potential. And if you follow your own path, you will find something new and exciting. You can take some of the courses that we do, people who are using AI for a while, and get it, uh, you know, get a bit of a head start. You can go onto parametricarchitecture.com and find workshops of many uh, tutors, including me, teaching AI. But uh, that being said, uh, the bottom line is um, we are constantly exploring ourselves as technology improves and uh, there is no standard way of practice at all. It is not like Revit. It's not like AutoCAD. Like it's so new. And so you should be excited about the fact. So just go out there, try it out yourself and uh, 
let your artistic instinct guide you. I think that's really the the only mm-hmm. thing that can really be of uh, substance in the world it, of AI. And in terms of prompting, what, what what how did you learn how to best prompt? Was it just trial and error, or did you get good trial resources? Trial and error, but yeah. be methodical about your approach, right? I think mm-hmm. a lot of what I learned in Zaha Deep Code is we learn to document our op- observations, come up with hypotheses, and create methodologies. And when you can, you know, repeat certain experiments, you understand the observations and the rules. Then that becomes your bible in a way. You just document all those things and it becomes quantifiable and then after that it becomes like a manual a rule book that you created yourself and you only add on to the rule book as you keep exploring all right uh, i like that so you we can find your courses at <clears throat> uh, pa academy can, can you show that on the screen maybe for people interested sure sure um <clears throat> so if honestly i can just go to my website yeah, yeah, we didn't talk about your own practice. What do you spend the most time doing in the, since you started oh, your own firm? Yeah, it's interesting because right now I've been more busy than I've ever been. Multiple uh-huh. projects as well as uh, exhibitions and um, teaching on the side and also just giving talks. Uh, all these things take a lot of time and um, it's quite fun for me. No complaints. So, yeah, the course itself is... Uh, right now in development for the next one but i don't know i think these links you can just go to how does this work maybe i need to update my website because uh, (laughs) i don't even know how it works copy link paste ah okay so parametric architecture.com i think they are one of the best platforms when it comes to uh the most new technologies and tools because they have a huge um, database of workshops and tutors that teach these things. And so you can see um, they have creative challenges that you can also participate and see how yourself compared to other AI creators. And then there's like architecture related things. There's AI related. So these are all kind of like some of them are ongoing. Some of them have been done in the past that you can get the recording. Like this one is mine. It's done in the past. But I do a new uh, lecture, a new workshop every two months or so. So you guys can stay tuned on my website, on my Instagram. Um, I will definitely announce the next course when it is available. Yeah. So it's like uh, 30 students and you can interact uh, directly with you to help you uh yes that's the beauty of it yeah we can work on it together you guys Mm -hmm. can produce whatever you want to produce and i will show you how to do it better in what direction and things like that yeah uh all right so let me just mention a couple of things before we're closing the show uh so thanks again to enscape for sponsoring this episode of bim pure live and don't forget to check out the Revit Pure new pamphlet number 30 at revitpure.com slash Excel to link bring Excel data into Revit. And next week episode is going to be with Josh Rattle, uh, third time on the show to talk about the new features in Enscape 3.5. And this is the season finale of the season of Bim Pure Live. And then we'll be taking a break. But this episode is next week. Same day on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, back to you, Tim. So is there anything else that you wanted to, to mention or showcase before uh, we leave for good? I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, perfect. So pe- people can find you f- find you at uh, s- just type in Studio Tim with Google or find your course. Yeah, uh, just Google me. <laughs> <laughs> easiest uh, all right yeah that was a, f- a fascinating talk to me thanks a lot for accepting the invitation and i i agree with you i share your optimism regarding ai i mean the safety concerns are valid the con- concerns are legit but i i think we it's also our duty to be optimistic and see that we use the tool for, for the best and improve design improve architecture and try to see the the tool for the good it can do so th- thanks for sharing these ideas yeah, thanks, Nicholas. It's been a pleasure sharing my uh, perspective on things and uh, to be part of your show. Had a lot of fun. 
and uh, hopefully we'll do some more things in the future. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, and see you again next week. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.